Charleston. This is ABC News 4 at 11. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Eisberg. New at 11, a deadly crash happened today around 340 in the afternoon on secondary highway 18. One of the drivers traveling westbound on the highway drifted into the center of the road, hit another car heading east. The drivers were the only occupants in both cars and the driver that was hit was taken by EMS to Trident Hospital. According to South Carolina Highway Patrol, the other drivers succumbed to their injuries on the scene. The crash is still under investigation. In Charleston County, starting at the intersection of Highway 78 and Ingleside Drive, that's where Highway Patrol says a chase ended in a deadly crash. They say a motorcyclist was trying to get away from deputies. That person disregarded a traffic signal and hit an SUV. The motorcyclist died at the scene. The sheriff's office says the chase started because of a traffic violation. Also new out of Charleston County, video showing a slow speed pursuit going through the heart of McClellanville. This was captured Friday night. The sheriff's office says it was following the car stolen out of Mount Pleasant. The driver went into Georgetown County, then back south into Charleston County and into McClellanville. People told us they saw this chase going on for the better part of an hour. In the end, oh. officials say two 14 year olds were arrested. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter has died, according to a statement from the Carter Center. She passed away peacefully Saturday afternoon with her family at her side. She had just recently entered hospice care at her Georgia home. During her husband's time in office, Rosalind Carter pushed for a more hands-on role, sitting in on cabinet meetings, uh, fiercely advocating for mental health. She is survived by her husband, former President Jimmy Carter, their four children, 11 grandchildren, and 14 great grandchildren. Carter was 96 years old. Here's your ABC4 Storm Tracker certified most accurate weather forecast. Well, it has been a stunningly beautiful weekend here in the Low Country. Hopefully, it will be the same as we head into this busy week of holiday travel. Storm Tracker meteorologist Chariston Clark here with your first look at weather. Chariston? Yeah, Mother Nature, she really knows how to throw a curveball right around the holidays. We're going to see a little bit of rain as we head into this week. We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes, but right now we are staying dry out there. High pressure in control. Hanging on to mainly clear skies this evening, seeing just a few high thin clouds out there, but that's about it. Temperatures, Georgetown, you're cool. We are our cool spot this evening, 45 degrees right now, 52 in Walterboro and 57 in Charleston. Thanksgiving is this week and we are looking at a beautiful Thanksgiving day forecast. Mostly sunny skies, temperatures will be very nice, much cooler in the low to mid 60s. But before Thanksgiving gets here, we do have a couple soggy days to talk about. We'll talk about how it could impact your travel. And of course, we're going to talk about those temperatures. Of course, those temperatures are a little bit cooler by Thanksgiving. All of the details on that coming up here in just a few minutes. Chariston, thank you. After a fatal wreck on Riverland Drive that killed four people, a petition has begun on James Island to remove what people are calling the Widowmaker tree. The accident yesterday was not the only wreck to have happened at this tree. Organizers of the petition say this tree responsible for many wrecks over the years. People believe the Widowmaker tree has become a symbol of grief and fear in the community. And they're asking James Island authorities to take immediate action to remove the hazardous tree before it takes any more lives. Mayoral candidate William Cogswell had his final public rally before the runoff election happening this Tuesday. A crowd of over 300 passionate residents came out to support Cogswell this afternoon, as well as elected officials, community leaders. The rally was an oyster roast held in West Ashley, in which Cogswell provided free oysters for all. The theme of the roast was unity and fellowship, bringing all of Charleston together. Well, the community getting into the holiday spirit by giving back. Lauren Lennon caught up with one food truck that is making a difference this holiday season. So today we're serving a Thanksgiving style hot meals. We have turkey, ham, cornbread, stuffing, rice and gravy, yam, sweet potato pie. Peterson and her crew setting up to make a difference. But this wasn't just an opportunity to serve the community, but also a chance to send the community an important message. 
I just want to tell the community, give from your heart. Um, give from a place where it's coming from a good place. I hope, I hope that they can take from this, that it's, it's nothing to, you know, just give. You can, we're giving away hygiene bags. If you don't want to give away food, you can give away deodorant, soap, anything um, inexpensive. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to cost a whole lot just to give. In addition to a hot meal, there was also hygiene products that included soap, toothbrushes, toothpaste, and more. This was the first time that the food truck hosted an event like this, and they wanted to be known that it won't be the last. Working for you, Lauren London, News 4. Lauren, thank you. Hockey for a cause. Today, Undie Sunday, the annual partnership between the Stingrays and charity organizations. Undie Sunday invites hockey fans to enjoy a Stingrays game while also making a difference. At this game, fans are encouraged to bring their underwear, not theirs, underwear that they buy. They throw it on the ice after the first goal of the game. All the underwear thrown is then donated to charity. So this is a great opportunity for people in the community to have a fun way to give by throwing uh, packs of underwear out on the ice. But ultimately it helps uh, us and other charities to get folks in the community who are ha having a, a tough time underwear if they need it. And this is what the ice looks like after all the underwear thrown on it after that first goal highlights of the game coming up later in sports. Striving to make the world a better place. One small act at a time. On Saturday, Acts of Kindness USA, Everyone Voice Matters, and the Henry Jenkins Group partnered up to bring the community together for Acts of Kindness Day, an event bringing the community together to remind them of the importance of being kind to one another. North Charleston Mayor-elect Reggie Burgess and State Senator Dion Tedder made an appearance, and they shared what this event means to them. It's a blessing because to see people who care about the community, talking to the community people, talking to the businesses, nonprofits, socializing together. The word collective efficacy. That means what are you willing, what are you really willing to do to make things better in the community? This is the start. We need organizations like Acts of Kindness, Everyone Voice Matters, and other organizations that are out here because these are boots on the ground people that are in our community every day doing the work. At the event, plenty of free food, plenty of Thanksgiving food, activities for children such as a train ride. Organizations had tables to share their services. A beautiful day in North Charleston. Governor Greg Abbott officially endorsing former President Donald Trump today in Trump's bid to be reelected as commander in chief. Abbott becomes the fifth governor in the nation to do so. At an event in Edinburgh, Texas, Abbott said Trump is the kind of leader that the American people need. He admires Trump's hardline policies on immigration. This comes as Abbott and Texas have been enshrouded in legal battles with the Biden administration over the current president's border policies. I'm here today to officially proclaim my endorsement for Donald J. Trump to be president of the United States of America again. And I'm honored by the governor's endorsement. That's a big endorsement. He's not, you know, he's not free and easy with endorsements. You look at his record. You don't do too many endorsements. I have to tell you that, governor. So this meant a lot to me. Back in 2021, Trump endorsed Abbott during his gubernatorial re-election campaign. And today's endorsement is a major boost to Trump's re-election campaign as his lead in the poll continues to expand. Coming up on ABC News 4 at 11, Israel's war with Hamas growing more deadly by the day. Get the latest updates from the Middle East with Christine Frizzell. Plus, what Palestine-Israel rallies did to upend a Democratic convention in California. Hear what protesters and California Democrats had to say about the event. In News 4 at 11, we're working for you with a Storm Tracker update. Another beautiful weekend in the books here in the low country. We've got a little bit of rain on the way, but don't worry. We're looking dry just in time for your Thanksgiving holiday. Otherwise, today we saw lots of sunshine. High pressure really took control and those temperatures were nice and comfortable. We hit a high of 72 degrees overnight. We fell into the middle 50s. Going to be slightly cooler as we head into tonight, but still relatively mild for this time of year. Temperatures already starting to cool down. Look at this Georgetown sitting at 45 degrees, 55. 
54 in Monk's Corner and Somerville and 57 in Charleston. So that high pressure is still in control and we are staying dry as we head into tonight, hanging on to just a few high thin clouds, but we will see an increase in cloud cover as we head into your Monday. If you want to get out and do some fishing tomorrow, maybe you have the day off. Maybe you've got the whole week off. You want to get outside and enjoy the weather. We're looking at great conditions throughout the uh, throughout most most of the day. Fair conditions between midnight and 6 a.m. So here's the thing, right? Is that high pressure briefly build in for today, but that will start to shift offshore as we head into your Monday, and that will allow for our next storm system to move on into the area. So let's go ahead and time things out, right? We head into your Monday morning. We're going to start off with partly cloudy skies. You're going to start to see that cloud cover on the increase as we go into the afternoon, and a shower or two can't be ruled out for the afternoon and the evening, but those rain chances really start to pick up overnight scattered showers. And then as we head into your Tuesday, can't rule out a rumble or two of thunder. We look at head to your Thanksgiving day. That always gets me right. A little turkey running across the screen there. We do have the turkey day run uh, Thursday. The race begins at 9 a.m. But of course, you've got to get there early. You've got to make sure that you're doing your warm ups, your stretches. Make sure you dress in layers though. Those temperatures will start off in the upper 40s, but by 11 a.m. We are back to right around 60 degrees. High pressure and control again. Mostly sunny skies, but before we get to Thanksgiving Thursday and all of those fun festivities, we have to talk about some rain. So here's the case. Remember that high is going to shift offshore. That low is going to start to bring some impact. So it'll start with the warm front lifting north as we head into your Tuesday. Then by Tuesday night, early Wednesday, a cold front will move on through and we are looking at some scattered showers and again, possibly a rumble or two of thunder. No day looks to be a washout right now. Just keep that uh, rain gear on hand. Temperatures, we should be sitting right around 68 degrees for this time of year. There's that warm front. We warm right back up into the middle 70s for your Tuesday. But then here's your cold front. Those temperatures fall back into the upper 60s for your Wednesday, low to mid 60s as we head into your Thanksgiving Thursday. It really wouldn't be Thanksgiving if we weren't just a little bit cooler, right? All right, so we still have about a week and a half left in the hurricane season, and we do have something to talk about. It's a small area of low pressure, and that's in the Central Caribbean, and it has a very low chance of development. It's going to start to meet with some dry air, and it's really that dry air is really going to prevent. Uh, further development, significant development. But of course, we'll keep a very close eye on things. We still have another week and a half left and we've got to monitor things after, right? The hurricane season, Mother Nature, she doesn't listen to those dates. So we'll continue to keep an eye on things, but things have been relatively quiet. Mainly clear, staying cool for tonight. Temperatures in the low 50s. We warm up only to right around 70 degrees. We've got that cloud cover. We've got those winds coming out of the northeast, 10 to 15 miles an hour. It will be a little bit breezy at times as well. So that's going to hold those temperatures down to right around 70 degrees, but still again, not bad for this time of year. Back into the middle 70s for your Tuesday, increasing rain chances, scattered showers, possibly a rumble or two of thunder as we head into your Tuesday and Wednesday, and if you are doing any holiday traveling, just plan accordingly and use a little extra caution, but we are certainly looking a lot drier and cooler by your Thanksgiving Thursday. Tonight, the Biden administration says they are closer than they have been at any point to some sort of deal to have some of the hostages released. But any agreement would come as the war has been escalating with reports of more than 11,000 killed in Gaza. National correspondent Christine Frizzau now with the update and a warning. Some of the video in this story may be disturbing to watch. Six weeks into the war against Hamas, the focus for Israel remains the same. The first goal is to d destroy Hamas, and the second goal is to bring back our hostages. The Israeli Defense Forces reporting raiding the luxury homes of top Hamas officials, where they found weapons and, quote, eliminated combatants, releasing videos like this. These are explosives. Vest with explosives. We have hand grenades. Offering what they call proof of vast tunnel systems beneath Al Shifa Hospital. This shaft was in a sheltered area inside the hospital under a car that was full of weapons, ready for forces that came near the hospital. The evacuation of Al Shifa ongoing, though dozens lay dead underneath these blankets outside the hospital. And in the north, an alleged bombing by Israel of a school 
turned shelter. Bodies lay scattered between the desks in what was once used as a classroom at the Al Fahura school in the north. One of the many snapshots of the horrors of a war that appears to be losing support. But the well over 11,500 deaths now, we estimate over, around two thirds are amongst women and children. We've had the deaths of over 100 humanitarian workers repeated attacks on health care and schools. President Biden in a new op-ed in The Washington Post doubling down on support for both Ukraine and Israel, responding to calls for a ceasefire writing to Hamas's members, every ceasefire is time they exploit to rebuild their stockpile of rockets, reposition fighters and restart the killing by attacking innocents again. A negotiated brief pause in the fighting uh, I think would be a good thing and I would strongly support. A ceasefire, meaning an end to Israel's campaign against Hamas, I don't support, and neither does the president. Still, others argue anything short of a ceasefire guarantees this brutal war will continue into the foreseeable future. I'm Christine Frizzau reporting. Protesters upended California's Democratic Convention on Saturday. A crowd calling for a ceasefire in Gaza interrupted the event while each of the major U.S. Senate candidates were on stage. And outside the convention, some Israel and Palestine supporters got violent. Michelle Bandour reports. Protests get heated at the California Democratic Convention. As hundreds of pro-Palestine protesters disrupt the political party's big event. I know what it takes to win tough races. U.S. Representative Katie Porter was on stage when they first interrupted the proceedings. Then security moved the crowd out of the main hall. For hours, they took over the lobby with a sit-in, saying they didn't have a choice but to become the agenda of this political meeting. We've tried everything that we can do the, the democratic way, and now um, we do just like, you know, protesting is our right. We're here protesting, and um, we're showing them, we're making them listen to us. Some delegates sat in their chairs in disbelief, saying they wanted to hear from the candidates, not the protesters. They've made their point. And now they've been asked to be quiet, and they're not being quiet. They're totally out of control. The protest escalated outside as pro-Palestine supporters clashed with pro-Israel supporters stealing their Israeli flag. If I have to stand here and take the brunt of abuse from these people to prove that we stand with Israel and our Jewish brothers and sisters, then so be it. I'll take that brunt. The war has divided some in the Jewish community. The group Jewish Voices for Peace sided with the Palestinians in this protest, setting out 500 pairs of shoes, which they say represents 5,000 children killed in the conflict. There's a lot of Jewish solidarity. There's a lot of Jews for ceasefire. We don't want what happened to us to happen to anyone else. Never again means never again for anyone. An hour-long flight from Miami to Havana on a near-empty plane delivers us to the beautiful but impoverished Caribbean island of Cuba. One of America's closest foreign neighbors, yet mostly cut off from the U.S. Partly frozen in time. Under the U.S. embargo, newer cars, even necessities, are expensive and difficult to get. Carlos Fernandez de Cosillo is vice minister of foreign affairs and Cuba's chief spokesman for our government approved visit. Anyone who would visit a country would know that we live a very modest life that our infrastructure needs a lot of investment in it, that we have lots of problems with our economy. What I would push to it, put to a test, allow the U.S. to lift the embargo for just two years and measure what Cuba can be done. With the U.S. relationship strained for so long, it's hard to overlook U.S. adversaries making new plays. China's influence is as evident as the thousands of China-made buses on Cuba's streets. In the news in the United States, there is a lot about China and concerns and allegations that China has already been operating some sort of base or 
surveillance operation out of Cuba and plans to have some sort of larger operation out of Cuba. Is that true? No evidence has been put in place. I mean, no evidence, but is it true? It, it is totally untrue. We've told the U.S. government. We've spoken with them. We said more. We said that Cuba is a country under aggression from the United States, that we have the right to defend ourselves, that we have the right to establish defense cooperation with other governments. And we That's Cuba's to... side of the story. Another side more often heard in the U.S. is expressed by Cubans like Siley Gonzalez, a former business owner now living in Miami, Florida. The situation of human rights in Cuba has been always bad. She and others point to government arrests after mass protests on July 11th, 2021. Cuba is a dictatorship and they are owning and being in the power in Cuba as the dictators that they are. They own the island, they create business for themselves, they create um, institutions for themselves, for protecting themselves. Americans will hear you say one thing and the United States government say something else. What are they to make of the two entirely different pictures being portrayed? They would have to look at it for themselves. Americans should ask their government to allow them to freely travel to Cuba and allow them for themselves to judge the reality. A new analysis of the China-Cuba relationship concludes the two countries are likely to increase their political and economic cooperation in the next 12 months, but that it's unlikely China will open new surveillance bases there. For Full Measure, I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Scott Iceberg, sponsored by Somerville Ford. Championship night. Good evening. It doesn't matter when in the season, where it is, or what type of tournament. If you were in it, why not win it? The Gamecocks 4-0 on the season, 2-0 so far in the Arizona tip-off. Tonight, the championship game of it. We head to Glendale, Arizona, and Lamont Paris has to like the way his team is playing. This is a team that was picked last in the SEC before the season. Miles Studi, 12 points, knocking down the three right here for South Carolina. How about Michi Johnson, the transfer from Ohio? Ohio State stop pop and hit for USC things are looking good second half BJ Mack the Wofford transfers outstanding three of his 27 on the night Jacoby Wright playing well as well 75 68 South Carolina wins they are champions of the Arizona tip off Charleston classic wrapping up this evening the tournament goes to plan the top two teams going in the top two teams coming out Houston ranks sixth in America but Dayton brings about 99% of the fans in the building providing quite a hostile uh, atmosphere for the Cougars. So we head down to TD Arena, downtown Charleston. Dayton fans like this. Isaac Jack, the Buffalo transfer, big time slam, but all Houston after that. LJ Cryer, buckets for him. Jamal Shedd, outstanding for Houston, and their defense really the story tonight. Houston wins this one quite easily, 69-55. Consolation game this evening, St. John's and Utah. Jordan Dingle from deep, knocking it down for St. John's, and then Dingle with the drive and dunk. It is the play of the game, maybe the tournament, the pen transfer. Outstanding. Look at this play right here. Two trees right in front of him, and he slams right through both. Then Joel Soriano throws down a big alley-oop. St. John's wins the consolation game, 91-82. That is a final from downtown. College of Charleston playing in the seventh place game of the Myrtle Beach Invitational. The two teams in the tournament who did not win a game in it played today. The college with three losses now. That's the same as last year's entire regular season, but you still play the game. It's still an opportunity to win, and most importantly, it's an opportunity to get shots to fall, and that's been a struggle. So we head up to Myrtle Beach, and there's Pat Kelsey, the head coach of the Cougars, and he's got to like the play of Ante Berzovic, the Serbian with the first eight points of the Croatian, I should say, with the first eight points of the College of Charleston's day, finally hitting some shots. Second half down three, Frankie Policelli, three Three ball is good. Then it is Policelli again. Another three ball. And this is an amazing statistic. The Cougars hit 17 threes today. 15 of them are from left-handed shooters. More Policelli again. He's outstanding from behind the arc. And the College of Charleston does come home from Myrtle Beach with a win. 80-72 the final. And that will do it for sports.
Yes, <laughs> we have scattered showers expected for your Tuesday and Wednesday. Be careful if you are doing any traveling, but much drier by your Thanksgiving Thursday. Perfect. Thanks so much. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early.